I'm David McGee, and this is the Mayo Lab Podcast. As we begin the Mayo Lab podcast, one of the most important aspects for us was not just basing our conversations around student and family well-being, talking about, say, uh, specific substances or saying don't do substances. Our, our plan was to delve in just like the fitness of the human inc- requires the whole body. There's the physical aspect. There's the mental aspect. There's the aspect of the soul. And uh, for us to really understand the well-being of students, for us to be able to think, uh, you know, what we're doing right, where we can go, It's important that we involve leading educators in that uh, conversation, people on the front lines with students and people on the, I'll say, cutting edge of it. And so today, I think we have one of those guests as as we look at kind of the whole body of student and family well-being, and we're excited about it. But first, as always, excited to welcome Alexis Lee. Hello. Alexis, if I haven't said it, uh, I don't want to choke up when I say this, because I might. Um... You you came to me some months ago and said you were called to this work and you wanted to sign up. And now we're uh, some, you know, eight or nine episodes into the Mayo Lab podcast. Plus, we're doing a lot of other work. And you have been an important part of the formation of this. And I thank you for that. Well, thank you for inviting me in and letting me be a part of it. Having a seat at the table figuratively and literally, this work is just I go home and I'm just like, I'm so lucky I get to do this work every day. And I get to work with someone I admire so much. Thank you. You know, um, speaking of admiration, mm. because I hold you in that. My wife has a, 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 stand, a line she says with me. She knows I love all humans and I, I very much love all humans. But it's kind of a joke line. She says, you're not easily impressed. And, and, <laughs> and, and I say, well, true, because we humans, it's a human struggle. And right. And I see the goodness in all humans and I'm impressed by that potential. Uh, but there's some people, um, Alexis, and I put you in that category, and I think that's why we really enjoy working so much together where there's this service above self. Mm-hmm. And um, we have a guest today that, uh, honestly, and I, I don't want to embarrass her, but re- really, she she's at the top of the list. So for me, right at the top of the list, and that's why she's on this podcast, because she is, when we talk about the body, she's all of it, mm-hmm. and especially my favorite part gets right down to the soul. So tell us who our guest is today, and let's get on with it. Our guest is Dr. Ethel Skurlock, who is Dean of the Sally McDonald Barksdale Honors College, Associate Professor of English and African American Studies, and Senior Fellow of the Lucky Day Residential College. Um, but what her resume won't tell you is I agree with you, David, as she's one of my heroes in life, and this is just going to be so much fun. <laughs> Dr. Ethel Scarlock, welcome to the Mayo Lab Podcast. Thank you for having me today. It's truly an honor to be here to sit with you and to sit with Alexis. And I guess we just have a mutual admiration fan club going on. So it's truly an honor. So thank you for having me. Thank you. So uh, before we get into specifics of students and working with that, you know, I'm interested in listeners hearing about you because your background fascinates me. You, You are... You serve today as dean, I think, of one of the top academic student institutions in all of the country, um, our Honors College here at the University of Mississippi. And that is such a vital role because that Honors College and its students excel in every way possible that, that it feels Ivy League to me in so many ways often, um, except we get to add that caring Mississippi touch. How did you get there? It's interesting because I'm not a person that pursues position at all. I pursue purpose. And so in no way was I ever looking to be a dean. In fact, people who know me well knew that one of my jobs or one of my kind of dream things on campus, I wanted to be an associate dean where I helped build someone else's vision. So that was my kind of goal and my desire. Did a lot of work in honors because I love our honors program. It is one of the best honors programs in the country to be able to deliver the kind of education we do um, without students having to pay additional fees. is absolutely incredible. I think that what they get is such a rich experience 
experience. So I've long been invested in honors education at the University of Mississippi. I taught Honors 101 and 102, our foundational courses, for about 17 years. I also led faculty development of Honors 101 and 102. So I was doing a lot of behind-the-scenes work. I also worked with our admissions, and I was just committed to the work. I'm not a person that has to be out front doing the work. In fact, when our dean, Douglas <laughs> Doug Sullivan Gonzalez, retired, I, I said that he was going to resign from that position. I was kind of mad at Doug. And so I called him up, like, what are you doing? Like, no, <laughs> this is not. We need you. So I truly was invested in supporting his vision, working to see how we could continue to enhance what he wanted. So anyway, as he was coming out, we had some conversations. The provost asked for some people interested in uh, serving as interim. And I was jumping in as interim, never thinking that (laughs) I would apply to even be the permanent dean. And I fell in love with the job, fell in love with the ability to create these spaces for faculty to do this dynamic work, the ability to help students live their dreams. And for me, it's just absolutely incredible because I don't have to compete with these high-performing students. Mm -hmm. I don't have to insert myself into their situation in any kind of way. All I have to do is listen to them, what they want to do, how they want to do it, try to find people to help Mm -hmm. us make it happen for them, whether that's attaching them to a donor, attaching them to a faculty member, attaching them to the right administrators, or even connecting them to alumni who can help open doors for them. My job is to make great people even greater. Uh And I couldn't find a better job to do. And when I wake up in the morning, I'm excited about how I can help somebody else and how I can serve this community, but in particular serve our Honors College students at the University of Mississippi. Now, that's incredible. And I I love what you talk about listening to students. And I think that's such an important thing. And we're going to come back to that in a minute. But one thing I do want to add um, that I think listeners will be interested to know about you that I don't I don't want to save I don't want to save <laughs> it, you 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 work sometimes I'm amazed at your schedule uh, because you're you're busy and I'm not sure how you juggle you family um, uh, leadership of the honors college engaging with those students as you do and on Sundays you are on the pulpit preaching. And so how in the world do you make all of that happen? And what is that about? Okay. Well, first of all, I always say everybody's busy, right? And nobody's busy is more important than anybody else's busy. Nobody's busy is more busy. Um, so I do feel like, I mean, I've, I've always been a worker. I enjoy work. I don't work as something to take away from me. It is something that energizes me. I also see all of my work as intertwined. I feel like my calling, my mission, my purpose in life is to educate, to uplift, uh, and to engage. So I'm educating uplifting and engaging as a professor in the classroom. I'm doing the same thing as an administrator, whether it's with the Honors College or with Lucky Day. I'm doing the same thing in the pulpit on Sunday morning. Um, I have a good friend who many years ago wrote a book called The African-American Sermon in the Literary Tradition. When he talks about the role of African-American preaching, he says the African-American preacher every Sunday morning has to get up and take a past history and connect it to the present of the people they're standing in front of Mm -hmm. and then make it serviceable in a way that it empowers them for the future. And that's my paraphrasing of it. So that's what I do every Sunday morning. I'm reading the past. It's historical, scriptural, religious, sacred text, trying to bring it to this everyday reality and using that to empower this community. And that's exactly what I do as a professor of literature. I take these old texts written in the 18th, 19th (laughs) century, trying to make it relevant to people sitting in front of me in the 21st (laughs) century. And then I want them to hold on to it in a way that services them in the future. Like even today when I came in, talking to a student from 1996 saying that I still have these books. They still mean something to me. I want that work to come alive. And so it's not different work, even though it takes place in different spaces. Wow. Uh, Alexis, uh, so so first of all, like I could, you could just drop the microphone I mean, on that yeah. one. You, you, you could walk on out of here. Um, I, that I'm going to think on that one for a long time because that's such power. And I agree with everything you say. Alexis, uh, Dr. Skurlock was humble 
when she talked about she likes to, she, you know, she's she's not seeking to stand in front. She just mm-hmm. wants to serve and is very comfortable being behind the scenes. Except, by the way, those of us that have seen her <laughs> lead oh, from yes. the stage, uh, I've seen her bring the house down. It She she does what she just did to us and just makes everyone <laughs> speechless. You walk out and you're going to think about it for the rest of the day, probably months of just she you lead so well from the front and the back. And I think when you you. lead from the back for me it's even stronger and you come out even more and I know that's something I've taken with me because we've had I've had the pleasure to work with you for since 2019 when I started with Ole Miss Women's Council and that opportunity to learn from you and see what you did and the passion you have for the university and how important that is has translated with me forward and I mean even all your your faith too so much of our um I think the the one thing we share a lot of things, I believe. Um, in one, uh, Doctor Skurlock is what you speak of is a purpose. You, mm-hmm. you, you, you have a purpose. You were called to it, and that's very much my journey. And I have the same thing. And I know Alexis speaks of the same. We know in human happiness, we know in human joy, that having a purpose is such an important part of it. Yes. And and but when we talk about young people, they're on this journey. How do we help them find their purpose? That's amazing. I think that finding purpose is a very personal journey. And I think that people have to believe that purpose is out there even when they do not understand it. Sometimes your purpose is simply to live through the moment. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you're 18, 19, 20 years old, your purpose is to live through the moment, to access all the things that you can, why you can, from the people you can at 18, 19, and 20, and just kind of have this faith, which is difficult to Mm -hmm. understand. I mean, if you had asked me 18, 19, 20, 21 years old what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it, you would have had 25 different answers Mm -hmm. about what I wanted to do. Um, But I think just walking, trusting that there is something um, at large, there's something big in some kind of way, all of your gifts, all of your skills, all of your ups, your downs, your ins and your outs are going to be used in a serviceable way. So sometimes the purpose simply is to find the purpose. And I see students get distracted or discouraged or upset because it feels like everybody else knows what they want to do. But even the ones that look like they know what they want to do often don't know what they want to do. Or they don't understand the depth of the calling. So um, when you're in school, especially for my students who are high-performing students um, in the classroom, when you're sitting there beside someone who said since they were in the first grade, they want to be a doctor, and now they're in the pre-med track, and they're already pre-accepted to medical school, and here you are reading books in English. Like, you know, how do you compare yourself? It can, it can be really deflating. Um, but it's okay. You just got to believe that you do the best you can at the level you're mm-hmm. on. And if you do well on that level, it's going to open the door to the next thing. You know, it's kind of like what I said about my own career and my own journey, that I was not in any way looking to become a dean. Mm-hmm. But then when I look back at the work that I did with the Ole Miss Women's Council, the work that I did on the athletics committee, the work I did in the classroom, the work I did as a faculty fellow, when I got ready to write up my mm-hmm. application letter, All of it came together, you know, for me. I'm like, okay, I have been preparing to be a dean all along, even though that wasn't my vision. Mm -hmm. So really purpose to me is one moment at a time, figuring it out and figuring out what is the thing that gives you peace, that gives you joy. And that's why I always say when people say, um, you know, how do you work so much or how do you do so much? I don't have an answer to that. I just get up and do what has to be done. And I enjoy it. Every bit of it. You know, every Sunday I'm in one church in Batesville, Mississippi at 9 o'clock in the morning. Then I go to Oakland, Mississippi at 11 o'clock. And then— Wait, like, you're preaching in more than one church? I'm in two churches. I am. I thought you knew that day, uh, but I, I am. I, I thought that was an occasional thing. <laughs> no, that's uh. every Sunday morning. Every Sunday morning. We start out at 9 o'clock at um, First United Missionary Baptist Church, and then we go down to Alvis Grove Missionary Baptist Church at 11. Wow. Um, and that's an interesting story. You probably don't want to spend your uh. broadcast talking well, about how I, I ended I'm, up in two spaces. Uh, I'm, I'm interested. Okay, I'll tell you, and then you can cut it if you no, need to. Bring, bring it. Uh, but the short story is, uh, again, some of those things that I know what I'm passionate about, which is teaching, empowering, encouraging, engaging. Um, so this guy started this church in Baseville. Then he was called to go to Oklahoma. 
asked me would I come help, and I'm like, okay, I'll just come help him out. So I went over there to help out, to stabilize. It's a very small church, um, trying to get everything together for them, and people started joining. We were doing things. I got the finances together, and I called him and said, um, well, I got everything together, so whenever you're ready to hire a pastor, I think we're ready for the search. And he was like, we're not looking for a pastor. You're the pastor. Huh. So that's kind of how I ended up in Baseville. I just had so much to give, and it wow. was given in overflow. My first husband at the time was pastor in a church in Oakland. He's deceased. I, I was a widow. I'm remarried now. Um, but he was in Oakland, Mississippi. He passed away. They asked what I helped transition them after his death. And it was a kind of similar story that I went down to help them transition because they had been very good to my family, to my daughters, um, and ended up stepping in and serving as the pastor of that church also. And that church was very different in nature. It's a church that's over 100 years old, um, founded in Reconstruction, powerful history, no history of women in ministry. In fact, um, and I'll be quiet, but I do want to say this. Yes. I did not, uh, they did not believe in women in ministry at all. And so. So are you the first? I'm the first. In fact, when my husband was alive, I wouldn't even go in the pulpit. I would sit uh, because they didn't believe in women in ministry. So I, um, again, I was just sit in the audience and say amen and (laughs) wear shiny clothes, you know, (laughs) shiny and smile real big and pet on the babies. (laughs) So that was my job you know they did not believe in female ministers and now here I am as their pastor so life is good it brings you to those moments and you Mm. just keep living I went from being licensed to preach in Ohio moving to Mississippi uh, where nobody believed in female ministers in the Baptist tradition and now to pastor two churches it's something bigger than me at work and I think it's at work for everybody. It's not just me. It's nothing special about me. And, and you make a great point. And as you're talking about your journey, I keep going back to what you were saying in regard to students about how you, you try to help them think, you know, so you, they keep moving through those moments and keep doing their work. And and have that that's kind of what faith empowers you to do, I think, a lot of times. And it doesn't mean you're just going to get what you want in that moment or it's going to go exactly like you want. What you're speaking of is resilience. Yes. And and so many times the resilience is the empowering element of all of that, that that can pay great dividends when you least expect it. I love that. And and I think that we have to do better about kind of sharing that those narratives are not narratives that are straight, that they mm-hmm. are up and down. And we make a lot of mistakes and we have a lot of crying nights and mm-hmm. a lot of midnight hour things, mm-hmm. you know, I always say to, and I don't know how spiritual you want to be or not want to be, but we love to um, quote the scripture that says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. But the question is, how long is the night? Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes the night is for months, sometimes it's for years, and you know, sometimes it feels like you can't get out of that situation. Um, but And we need to be more honest about that when people celebrate where we have arrived We need to be honest about what it took and how many tears and how many struggles and how many failures and how many doubts we had along the way. And that's one of the challenges of students who grow up or young people who grow up with this social media Mm -hmm. emphasis. And I don't I don't consider social media fake. I feel like it just emphasizes the highlight reel. It, it, it might look a little. It, it yeah. might look a little easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. when you talk about submitting your resume and you 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 know you decide, okay, well, I will apply for this job, and you have this body of work. The resume, kind of like the social media, doesn't always, in that curated form, allow for everything that happened in between. You talked about being widowed. You, you know what we know is you you may have arrived at that point, but just like me on my journey, people say that's amazing where you've gotten. I'm like, yeah, it was a long hard crawl that yeah. night was long it was that long. night was long you know and and i think that with students and and even sometimes their parents is helping them understand that um it doesn't always feel great but that is that is the human experience of of how we get to joy that's how we get to that destination is really learning that resilience and in, in enduring that and to be able to stand on the mountaintop you know Mm -hmm. I love what you're saying of like 
in the Psalm 23, it says like through the valley of the shadow of death. It's like through it. You're not going to stay there in a way. And I remember I was talking to my counselor at one point and I was like, I just wish the highs weren't so high and the lows weren't so low. Oh, I love it. And then it. she was like, if you're looking for the middle ground, you know, if you look at a heartbeat, you flatline if you just stay in the middle. Mm. Like you don't oh, live. Wow. And I always just keep that in my head of like, it, it's it's a it's a heartbeat. It's a through. It's going to keep moving. You keep moving forward. I love that yeah. analogy. I'm going to use that Sunday. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Alexis just made her way to the pulpit. Yeah. Hi, I'm David McGee. Now, more than ever before, parents need better information about the challenges facing their children. What sorts of issues to expect and when, and the warning signs to look for. From anxiety and depression to addiction, eating disorder and loneliness, students and their families are facing a mental health and substance misuse epidemic that requires new guidance. My new book, Things Have Changed, what every parent and educator should know about the student mental health and substance misuse crisis, offers a clear roadmap for helping students find the joy they want and deserve. Head over to themayolab.com to sign up for our newsletter and find a link to pre-order my new book. And everyone who signs up for our newsletter and pre-orders a copy of Things Has Changed will receive a digital copy of my expanded student toolbox. Visit themayolab.com today. You are listening to the Mayo Lab Podcast with David McGee. Now, back to the episode. Alexis, you know, I'm dating myself uh, because what I'm about to say is to sound like the old guy sitting here to say when we were young, but I'm going to say that. Back, back when I was young, there were plenty of pressures. Uh, they were self-applied, I think, that um, I certainly felt pressure uh, to perform and excel because that's what you do as a young person. You're told to behave, to go to school, to do activities like sports or whatever and do well. Where I sound like an old person is, I promise you, things have changed. What young people feel is pressure today is so much more intense and at times I think unfair. Um, they share with us that, you know, they they feel they're not sure they can earn the money their parents earn or buy the car that they were given or even afford a college education. And they have to, if they're playing sports or activities, they're expected to be the best and they're supposed to make A's. And I don't know where this goes, but it seems like a lot of pressure has mounted on teens and students today like never before. It really, I think it really has. And I know I'll speak from experience. When I was in college, I was on a volleyball scholarship here. And so there was a lot of other, you have to perform in school, but you also have to do all these other things to be on the team and to be a part of it. And so when I was in college, though, even I had classmates that were talking about they their parents only gave them four years to finish their college degree. And, you know, whether that was you finished with an actual degree you signed up for or you just finished with a bunch of credits and you didn't really have a degree, you had four years. And I think it's even gotten heightened to this point. Um, Dr. Skurlock, and I know you work with students a lot and probably can speak to this better, of the pressure students feel to be successful in college and get a degree has escalated. I agree. I think the pressure comes from a lot of different directions. So as you began to speak about some of the economic pressures, mm -hmm. I mean, the costs are astronomical. And I don't think there's anything that we can do about that. I don't think it's turning back. Um, and so when I was in school, people could get a part-time job and put themselves through school. The economy does not uphold that. The cost of tuition is so much more than what per year than what most people are making as a salary mm -hmm. uh, full time yeah. with multiple degrees. So it just does not uphold that. And that economic pressure is a lot. People feel like if I'm going to invest this much, I want it to pay off. The other pressure that I think parents don't often think about and understand is that uh, there's been a big shift in what it means for students to go to college. Number one, there is information coming at them in a very different way, very rapid kind of movement of information. So um, it wasn't many years ago, 20, 25 years ago, where if you wanted to do a research paper, you went to the library, you went to mm -hmm. the card catalog, right. you got a card and you went and physically found this information. And now it's changing on a daily basis. There is a different pressure. The other pressure that's very different is even in terms of when I was in school, we had a Tuesday, Thursday class and a Monday, Wednesday and Friday class. If I had a paper due 
in my English class that met Tuesday and Thursday, I would write my paper out and I would bring it to class on Thursday. Like there was no way that I could miss that deadline. Now your Tuesday, Thursday class may say your paper's due Sunday night. Then your Mm -hmm. Monday, Wednesday and Friday is saying it's due Wednesday morning. Like the times, the the way things come at you nonstop, there's never a Mm -hmm. break. That's real for our students. And so to make a joke out of it or to take it lightly that they're under pressure, I think really is a disservice and really means that we're not taking a an honest and sincere look at how the world has changed for young adults today. And you right there just hit on something so important, Dr. Skurlock. When I talk to college students around the country and when I talk to high school students, they talk about being overwhelmed. Yes. They feel overwhelmed by the schedule. And I have learned that the some of the high schools, so what, a lot of what we do in the William McGee Institute for Student Wellbeing and the Mayo Lab within that is try to get into schools. You know, I'm in a lot of schools throughout the country. I get to meet with a lot of students and parents and listen. And learn, and we're trying to bring it back in so we can think what we can curate and help spit back out and engage others. You just put your finger on, I think, one of the key elements, which is how the schedule has changed in a bit of a chaotic way. And I think the rest of us parents and educators maybe don't realize that impact. Where I'm seeing some positive um, results are schools that have decided to really think about how to emphasize teaching calendaring better. Mm-hmm. Um, when freshmen arrive, I often tell them, parents say, or freshmen, hey, what's one piece of advice? And I'll say, "Learn, you know that calendar on your smartphone? Learn how to use that. Absolutely. And they will laugh, but I say that thing will, will, will save you. And, and it also can transform you. And so uh, in some of our school's work, um, we're, we're, we're beginning to think about, you know, sharing with others and maybe bringing others to the table around how to engage around uh, creating perhaps some kind of uh, interactive calendar. And because we're seeing that that's such an incredible element. So in the Honors College, Look, you, you, the, that's some high demand. I know my it son is. William was in yes. the uh, uh, McDonald Barksdale Honors College at the University of Mississippi. He made A's throughout. He had a phenomenal experience. I was always amazed at how how deep his education was. I was always amazed at, at the rigor of it. So, how when 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 a student comes in and starts this program, I mean, what 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 do what kind of messaging do you guys try to send to them? Is like, here's what you're embarking upon, and here's how we'll navigate this together. You know, I have to be honest to say I'm not sure that we fully navigate that well in terms of how we welcome our students on campus. One thing I can say I do is we we try to keep our doors open. We try to always engage. I do a weekly dean's message where I talk about um, some of the issues or some of the pressures, inviting students to come by and asking them to connect with us so we can connect them to resources on campus. So I really do try to push the resources out to tell them about uh, places like the McGee Center. Um, But I'm not sure that I have any kind of magical answer about how we address this. I think it's especially important that we think about it in the state of Mississippi. I know you have some passion and interest in rural education and and what does that mean? But What I worry about is the fact that we are a state institution. We're a flagship institution. What a student gets in terms of educational preparation and calendaring, uh, being able to calendar from a private academy or from an academy, a school in a, um, what do I want to say, an affluent school district. Well, well, you could have a public school district that has an endowment, right? That's correct. That's correct. Versus, and many of our kids from rural Mississippi are still old school. Like Mm -hmm. I said, I was. They're handwriting Mm -hmm. papers. They're turning them in in class. They don't know how to... um, They don't know how to use all these different systems. So I try to make them aware that it's okay not to know. Mm -hmm. A student can come in as a freshman at the University of Mississippi. They're going to have to learn Blackboard as one platform. Then they're going to have to learn another platform for their math classes, another Mm -hmm. platform for modern languages, another platform for the science classes. So there's this rapid fire that you can adjust to if you've come from an affluent school Mm -hmm. district. If you have never had to use any platform and all of a sudden you're using all of these platforms, 
It is scary, and it can make a student feel like they're ready to drop out. So the thing that I think that we do best is to reach out to our students over and over again to pay attention to progress, to pay attention to class attendance, pay pay attention to uh, what's happening in those classes so we can catch students early on. And then if I have um, someone that says, I'm struggling, let me let them know it's okay to struggle. Let's connect you to these resources. Let's teach you those resources and let's help you succeed. And that's been one of my challenges in Lucky Day and in Honors College to make sure students know when they come into my office, they're not coming in there for punishment or because you failed. Mm. We're coming because we want to help you create a success plan. As they as they might say in the congregation, um, amen. <laughs> <laughs> amen to that. Uh, I do feel strongly about... Um, creating access and equity and all for education. You can look even in our region. We're based at the University of Mississippi, and in our region we have regions like the Mississippi Delta. There's not far away the Alabama Black Belt. And actually, if you go traverse throughout this country, there are deserts all over in pockets. And um, that my daughter told me when she arrived at the university, she said, You know, by the time I uh, came up and then went through nursing school, also, I was prepared because I had those advantages. I was taught how to study. I was taught how to use Blackboard. So she says, I didn't I didn't have a cold start there. And she really articulated that well and helped me understand. I have dreams. You know, you you think about the um, it'd be fun to to. When you think about the capacity of students you have in the Honors College, and we'll just take the Mississippi Delta or mm-hmm. areas of underserved students as a, you know, it 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 it's very exciting to think about potential collaboration because what I love to do, and you said it early on, so I know it's what you love to do, listening yes. to students yes. is the magic. What I always say, they have a lot of the answers, and um, I think that if we can deepen. Um, you know, our our engaging with students to help us solve these problems. I, I, I led a uh, seminar once uh, over in the Delta region. I was involved with Mississippi Today, the uh, uh, nonprofit news organization, just as they were getting organized. And I went through this listening session. And we invited young people through through the Delta region to come to this listening session. We're just listening. I'm just facilitating. I wish I could tell you this was my idea. It was their idea wow. because they began to talk about how we are talented, but we don't get the resources to help us understand our capacity. They said, you know, what if somebody taught us in high school filmmaking? We could be great filmmakers. And that's a burgeoning business right now, and it's very hot. I was in Baltimore recently, and I looked at a well-funded school, and they are teaching craft woodworking. And uh, somebody else is showing me beekeeping, which, by the way, in this era, (laughs) see, I like that, right? Beekeeping, which is a highly profitable craft business. It is very good for the environment, which, for example, in an ag area like the Mississippi Delta fits it so well. I'm like, we need to be teaching students how to sell honey and beekeep, and we can all laugh except what a what a beautiful amazing business and i think getting getting all of us around uh getting young people around the table in these types of solutions because these were not my ideas wow these were not my ideas these came from young people so that listening, and I think it really is is the gateway to opportunity there so um in in your work like um how what what is the you, because you you did come through the resume so to speak whereas you talked about it the resilience along the way and it wasn't easy but now you are dean of the honors college you are preaching twice on sunday and you do have a family once you once you do achieve some things how do you manage yourself in oh, that wow. how do you how are you doing in that <laughs> I don't know how I manage myself. Um, so one of the things I said I should have said earlier when we talk about how I do everything, I do have good teams around me, starting with my family team, um, then the staff members I work with. So I don't have to do everything by myself. 
Uh, managing myself requires doctor's visits uh, to make sure that I'm doing the right things in terms of my health. Also doing a lot of escape. And I, I will have to say my husband has is a great partner and friend. I'm so thankful I married him in this season. He's a country man from mm-hmm. Charleston, Mississippi, and he likes country things. All right. And so he likes to do things like get in uh, ATBs. We get on side-by-sides and oh. four-wheelers and ride in the mud. And that wow. allows me to get away have a good time, not think about having to be an academic, not having to service anybody. And one thing about this work, you know, when you do work that's in front of people, people don't allow you the opportunity to be off. So I can be in Walmart and somebody would say, I've been looking for you. Mm -hmm. And they want to tell me their problems or Mm -hmm. what they need or what their child needs. And I'm going to stop and I'm going to listen. Because that's Uh, you. You can't turn it off. Yeah. And that's our job, right? So I do that. But if I'm out there in the mud, (laughs) having Ah. a good time, nobody can bother me. So that's a very big part of my identity now, being able to get out, walk, do the mud, and really stay on top of my health. I, I, I will say that I've had moments where I was so busy serving other people, I did not serve myself. But we know it's cliche, but it's true that if I don't serve myself, I won't be around to serve anybody else. Um, And I started doing that in increments, even with my children at a very young age to say, because I do work Sunday through Friday, I stopped doing Saturday engagements. Mm. No matter how good the engagement was, I had to learn that I couldn't be at every engagement. Um, So Friday night is date night with with my husband. And when my children were at home, that was their day, whatever they wanted to do. But they would sit around in their pajamas or go shopping or whatever. I just had to have that time for them. And when I'm off on Sunday, when I finish that second sermon, I'm off. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I am off yeah. for real. So, Hey, two sermons in a row, I would <laughs> yeah. be exhausted. <laughs> and I am. I am. I'm absolutely off. I'm about to go hang out with family and have a good time and be myself. So those are some of the things I do. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, that might be, Alexis, the mo- a, lot of, a lot of wisdom has been mm-hmm. imparted so far. That might be number one. The, the, the most important thing we can do for ourselves often is learn the word no. Yeah. And it and it starts with saying no to others, but it 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 also is foundationally saying no to ourselves I because we want to be pleasers and we want to be yes people. I'm very impressed that uh, you can draw that line because when you are a people person so called it's not that easy. Yes. What advice do you have for students cuz I know when I talk to students and I say take time for yourself, time block you know, self-care time and their fear is, but I'm missing out on all these things my friends are doing, or I'm missing out on an experience. How, what advice would you give to students specifically as they're trying to stand up those barriers? Oh, I think it's bigger than any piece of advice I could give. You know, they talk about FOMO, fear of missing out. Mm-hmm. Um, but most things that you're going to miss out on, you'll get another opportunity to do. Like if you miss out, especially if you're at Ole Miss, if you miss one party, it's another one that same there's night. There's another one That coming. same night, there's uh-huh. another one. So, uh-huh. I mean, it's not like you're not going to have another opportunity <laughs> to be in a party. We have so many organizations. Mm-hmm. If you don't take um, that leadership position, I promise there's another one that needs you. Um, really just believing that, You can't do everything and do everything well. Like, you have to make some decisions about what you really want to do. And I don't know how to fix that. I mean, for example, many of our students are professional box checkers, right? That's how they got to where Mm -hmm. they are. They learned how to be. You know, I had a student tell me, like, for every organization, they were the vice president because they didn't want to be the president because the president had to do all the work. And they knew vice president still looked good. Uh, So, (laughs) I mean, they are savvy about accepting all these different um obligations. So, you know, I think the pressure is for real. I also think that they have to believe if they whittle down and choose to do the things that they do and do those things well, deeper is often better Mm -hmm. than being wider. I just like to go deep into what I do. So again, even though I said I'm in these different locations, it's the same thing. Right. So I'm mm-hmm. always going deeper and always trying to figure out how to do what I do. So yeah. I took, for example, um, my mom, my father was a pastor, and my mom always wanted church musicians for children. So we took um, piano lessons for years. And so I would have to play the piano at the church when I was growing up. But I'm an awful piano player. I'm awful. I can play about eight hymns, and I might mess up in the middle of those eight. So I'm awful. So on Sunday morning, am I going to spend my time 
over here on the piano just to say mm. I did it. Just, just check and, a box. And yeah, check my box and, and broaden my resume to say yeah. not only am I a pastor, I'm also a church musician. <laughs> <laughs> so I could, but yes. would it be useful for anybody? Right. It would not. It would take away from the thing I'm really called to mm-hmm. do, and it would take away from the broader service. So I encourage students to find the thing that you really do and, and focus on those things and do them well. And and it's okay to say no. Like you have mm-hmm. another opportunity to say yes. Mm-hmm. The uh, somebody told me several years ago. Well, see, it was probably about twelve years ago when my life had crashed and I was getting back up on my feet. So even by then, I was in my mid forties. It was kind of like what students face because I felt like I was twenty one all over again. What am I going to do with my life? I'm starting anew. And I remember getting some advice because I had been doing that. I I was building a resume of I've done this and I have done that and I was checking boxes and it felt like running the proverbial hamster wheel. And somebody I respected as a friend and in business, they said, you know what? You've got some talent, and uh, what you ought to think about is about just just what two or three things can you accomplish in a year. They wow. said, if you could do two or three things with that talent really well, it, it, it will far outshadow what you can do trying to prove your everything. And I think that goes back to uh, your, your organ playing. Um, what's the point? Right. Right. What's the point? Was, did you feel pressure from your mother to to see that all the way through, or was that— I did. Um, I did. I mean, she kept us in lessons, and we had to go. We had to take lessons. We had to show up. And uh, I grew up in a rural church, so if the musician didn't show up, we were doing it. So yeah, we saw it through as much as she could force us to, and once I hit college, <laughs> you were that like was the, over uh, with. That was over with. Yes, it was over with. The moral of that story, and there's an important moral— is that our parents aren't wrong for trying to give us exposure to things. And so I'm not suggesting that. But at the end of the day, what we have to remember about young people is they are going to go where they are going to go. I love that. I love that. And I appreciate the discipline. You know, even my mom made us take ballet lessons. Uh You can look at me and tell that was not a good (laughs) idea. Uh, But I was doing ballet and Uh tap and all these different things. They They taught discipline. They taught how to stick to things. They taught me even how to fail, how to how to do mm. things not well, how to not be at the top of something and cheer other people on. It's okay not to be the best at everything. It's okay to be the worst one in the class and stay in the class and do what you're supposed to do and then celebrate the ones who do it really, really well. So, I mean, every lesson, I think uh, every opportunity, every engagement is an opportunity to learn something about what your purpose is on this planet and something about what your purpose is not Mm. on this planet. Well, and and I think that is the magic, right? Alexis here is we we talk a lot about management, about how we find our place and what our calling is in being able to say no. And, and, you know, I think one thing I appreciate, Alexis, is we talk often about what we're not good at. Mm -hmm. And and we are not all good at everything. I myself, I always say, don't ask me to teach algebra. (laughs) Do not ask me if if you want me to to take an algebra uh, test. Yeah, yeah, or yeah. I'm a don't ask me to take an algebra (laughs) test either. I I did pass it, but it was not pretty. But but that's okay. That's okay. And um, it 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 does take some humility though. And it took me really deepening the learning about myself that at times I needed to spend more time focusing on really what I'm not good at, so I can just let that go and or let it be a learning lesson, you mm-hmm. know, and be able to parlay it into strengths. And I think with with young people in particular, and it's a good lesson for parents and all is like it's not helping them empower themselves with that freedom to not be all things. And that's mm-hmm. such an important message that you are all talking about is you, you don't have to be all things and there's real freedom once you let it go. There is. And we I was just reading and taking some assessments, learning about our, myself and how I work well in, in work and my skills. And it was talking about there's some areas that if that are not my strengths. And it said, if you spend too much time in them, that's how you feel burnt out. That's how you f- lose joy and passion and purpose. And I want that to be something students learn more and lean into more to understand it's not your strength. God didn't give you that. Mm-hmm. You're not mm-hmm. supposed, you have so many other strengths. Mm-hmm. You can lean into those. But if you try and 
fit this square weakness into a round strength hole, it's going to force more pressure on you. It's going to force uncomfortability. And I know when I was in a season of burnout, I look at my weakness or the, you know, things I was not gifted at. And that's all I was doing. Wow. I wasn't giving myself space or time to do the things I am really disciplined at because I was trying to make these strengths or weaknesses more strengths. And, and sometimes, Alexis, that is powerful. Yeah. And, and sometimes, yeah. Alexis, well-meaning parents, hear me. You mean well. You love your child. You want from them so much to be what you want. And what you just said, Alexis, one of the most important things, any parent listening today, if you could just take a moment, even if it requires having them take a formal test, though as a teen, their personalities will morph and change. They're not all set. But really, parents, I think, that can more understand the personality assets Mm -hmm. of their children might help them not necessarily push them into to the spots that create yeah. their burnout. Mm-hmm. And I think that is we 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 we're down at Alexis and I were at a meeting in Georgia recently where we're talking to some leaders in education and there was a lot of time spent on this subject about um, how, what are some programs we can perhaps put in place in K through 12 that can do a better job of students helping assess their personality? Like you're talking mm-hmm. about, you just took one. Well, like yeah. Alexis and I work together, we've even done our own personality yeah. assessments to see, and guess what? Our skills match up very well together, wow. right? Strengths against weaknesses make a good team. And so, but helping young people mm-hmm. better understand it's not just that you have to take this class to get a degree, Absolutely. it also is helpful to understand who you are. Absolutely. And I think as parents, we really have to step back and it can be very difficult. I I think about my own journey with my daughters. My oldest daughter graduated from the university in 2019. Um, And so my path had been, as soon as I finished my undergrad, I did my master's and I did my PhD. And because she had the resources, the opportunity and the ability, I wanted her to do the same thing. I wanted her to just jump into a graduate program. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, okay, take a year off and then we'll do it. And so um, after working a year for a corporation, she decided she wanted to do an internship with a nonprofit in Nashville. And we said, okay, I help support that as long as you're applying for graduate school while <laughs> yeah, you do right, that. Right. So, stay and on I my did. track. Yeah, you got to stay on my track, but I'm going to pay for it. So uh-huh. I did. She took the internship. Uh-huh. We uh, took care of her. And, you know, as she got towards the end of that internship, she was really not happy. She was beginning to have a whole le- new level of stress and anxiety. And finally, I'm like, Jasmine, do you want to go? To graduate school, she was like, no. And I'm like, Mm. but then you don't have to. And she cried. She was like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, plenty of people get a degree and they're finished and they live for a lifetime. But as a parent, as much as I say, be who you are, I found myself trying to push my child Mm. into a place that didn't fit her in that moment. If she goes back, she goes back. And like I told her, you know, you'll be a young adult and you'll fund it and you'll do it when you're ready. And if you don't. That's okay, okay, too. It's not a failure. You, you're you amazing. Yeah. So she's doing nonprofit work and having wow. a good time and uh, enjoying it. It enjoying won't it. always look. My, my son Hudson um, always say, I'm so proud of him. Like, I look at who he is. I look at what he does for a living. I look at how he engages with other people. And and if you had asked me when he was young, even into high school, is that the career picture I would have drawn up? You know, he he's great in sales. He thrives in selling real estate. Just got his broker's license. He has a craft ice cream company. Yeah. He, he's an expert in fly fishing. But what he really is is an extraordinary human. Oh, wow. I, I've just never heard, I, I'm telling you, I've never heard him pass judgment on another human. Oh, wow. And in fact, once he heard me, I hope it was just once, <laughs> uh, and he he calmly paused and said, Dad, that's not going to serve you well. Oh, wow. You, what you a just think thing. about where that's coming from. And, he, you know, he, he does, he's a quiet person and doesn't talk as much as I do. But when he, he talks, he carries a big stick. And um, But I'd say all that to say is look at who he is. Yet, if if someone had given me a marker when he was in middle school or high school or my wife a marker, and we thought we had one, to draw up what his life would look like, it wouldn't have looked the same. That's correct. Joke is on us, parents. Joke is on us, just like you with your daughter. Uh, Dr. Scarlock, uh, one, one really important question to me is, is we near running out of time. So back back to you. And and. 
you have had a remarkable career. And what I'd love to say about you is it's not done yet. And you're, 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 you're where you're supposed to be and you are thriving in that. And so many students and those you work with get to benefit, but um, there, there's more work ahead from you. But I, I must ask you, as you reflect back, and you've been through this path of where, you know, you came into education and been a tenured professor, right? And, yes. and then moved into management of the leadership with the uh, residential college. And, you know, like you said, this long resume. Um, you know, do you, I think a lot of young people, when I talk to young people, they share a lot to me about um, imposter syndrome, mm-hmm. and I I relate to them because I always have the same thing. The difference in me is I don't have a P. You know, I work at a university and I have a bachelor's degree, and I'm very proud of that bachelor's degree because it wasn't in the cards for me. You know that that's that's just where I am. But at times people say, "Well, this is so amazing. You've had a best selling book, or you've achieved this." But I'm battle feeling. At times, despite achievements, like, do I belong here? And what I find is I talk to people, I think everybody at some time along their journey has some degree of that. And so it, tell, tell me about, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, <laughs> I have no idea how you feel, but as you've been on this journey, tell me about how you've taken steps along the way and how you have felt in this. So if we want to talk about um, this idea of imposter syndrome, you know, I think I don't feel so much that I'm an imposter, but I do feel that well, idea. Well, you're not. <laughs> well, I'm I don't know. I may be. Your, I may be. I may not be self aware. No, no, no. I, I, no, oh, no, 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 no. No, but I was I'm talking say, about the feelings. Yeah. yeah. The, and I was going to say, I feel the idea of not belonging. Hmm. And I remember a trusted mentor who I still consider a mentor and a friend. Um, I, once I was an English professor, tenured as an English professor, had no joy in doing that work at all. Just absolutely no joy. I had to figure out another way. I loved the teaching part. Didn't like the research. Didn't like so much departmental service or service to the profession. Had to figure out a way to transition out and had connections to that. But as I was trying to figure out how do I transition and do something different, um, I remember talking to a mentor um, at the university. And he said, well, this place is not for everybody. And that kind of broke my heart. Like, I didn't come here for you to tell me it's not my place. I came to get guidance about how I create the space to be in this space. Not mad at them. I still consider them a mentor Mm -hmm. and friend. They said all they knew how to say at that moment. But there are many moments where I have felt like, you know, maybe this isn't the space. Um, uh, Maybe, you know, as a female or maybe as an African-American that maybe I'm trying to push the envelope too much. But... When I feel that, I just kind of try to talk back to it, David. That's mm-hmm. all I can say. But I think there are a lot of things that make you feel that way. I think about even serving on the athletics committee. I had the opportunity to serve on the um, on a search committee that hired one of our athletics directors in the past and that hired one of our football coaches. And I was so excited that they invited me to be a part of this committee. Um, and so I'm reading everything and trying to read the message boards and everything about this. <laughs> and uh, got on the message board one day and they were like, I can't believe they let a hyphy on the committee. And I'm like, what in the world what? is a hyphy? I didn't know what that was. And so I'm like, who is the hyphy? So I'm going down the committee and trying to figure out. <laughs> You're like, out, who is this yeah, person which one they is the speak hyphy? of? I'm looking it up. I can't figure it out. I'm Googling it. And I'm like, is this some kind of religion? Just faith. What is the hyphy? <laughs> and so I'm trying to, I could not figure out who the hyphy was and why they were on the committee. And finally, I realized, I don't know how it finally got to me, that the hyphy was a woman with a hyphenated name. And my uh, name was Ethel Young hyphen minor at the uh, time. And so they were mad that I, as a woman, was a, with a hyphenated name, was allowed to serve on this committee. So there are those moments where you feel like, yeah, I don't belong. Mm. But I must belong because I keep mm. I keep getting asked to come back and show up and do the work that I do. So I just kind of just show up and do the work no matter what. And um, we're so thankful you do. Thank and you. I think your power and your resilience down to being the first woman to take a pul- the pulpit in a church that wasn't used to it, down to your leadership in the university. Look, you're you're blazing new ground and you're doing it. You are not an imposter. <laughs> you you are carrying the power and the strength of something bigger than all of us and we're so 
so thankful. Thank Do- you. Yes, thank you. Dr. Ethel Scarlock, thanks for listening to us on the Mayo Lab podcast. And also for Alexis Lee, we shall see you next time. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Mayo Lab podcast. The Mayo Lab podcast is produced by Dr. Natasha Jeter, Dr. Megan Rosenthal, David McGee, Alexis Lee, and Slade Lewis. This podcast was recorded at Broadcast Studio in Oxford, Mississippi. The show was mixed and mastered by Clay Jones, and our original music was composed by Slade Lewis. The Mayo Lab podcast is brought to you by the William McGee Institute for Student Wellbeing. For more information on the Mayo Lab, head over to themayolab.com and follow us on social media at the Mayo Lab. If you enjoyed listening to the Mayo Lab podcast with David McGee, we need your help. Tell others about it. And we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give us a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this podcast. This podcast represents the opinions of David McGee and guests of the show. This podcast is not intended to be a substitute for the medical advice of a licensed counselor or physician. The listener should consult with their mental health professional in any matters relating to his or her health or the health of a child.